being formally educated in entrepreneurship is like, imagine if you were thrown to the wolves, but you had someone to cry on. It's one of those things where, you know, opportunity meets skill. I showed the PowerPoint to the right person and 11 months in, they're like, hey, YJ, we love for you to help lead several initiatives. And I've been with the Adelphi Startups team for the past four or five years now. I'm sure Michael is very passionate about startups being a startup 40 years ago himself. Tactically, we are working with multiple community leaders all across the U.S. and really aligning with them to figure out how we can support them with all the things that we have to offer. It's all about building connected community. Community is really the answer to a lot of problems that and not only startups, but you know everyone in our life is having. Dell's mission is to create technologies that enable human progress. It's going to be great to watch you help Dell for Startups grow and the impact that you're going to have on those communities. Welcome to Forging the Future, and I'm here at South by Southwest with YJ Lin, the Senior Program Manager for Dell for Startups. YJ, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So what, what is Dell for Startups? What are you trying to do with this program? Yeah. You know why this year is a special year for us is because mm -hmm. we're hitting our 40th anniversary when Michael Dell first started his company in 1984. And there's been versions of different startup initiatives over time, but I would say we just want to be there as a support and kind of similar to Michael Dell's journey when at his time he realized that no computer technology company at the time was creating custom solutions for people. And so we are working with multiple community leaders all across the U.S. Of course, our fair first partners at the Canon in Houston and really aligning with them to figure out how we can support them with all the things that we have to offer. I'm sure Michael is very passionate about startups being a startup 40 years ago himself. I find it interesting and somewhat maybe coincidental, but you know, the Canon located right there, where it's located is right where Michael Dell grew up. It's very close to Memorial City, okay. right? I mean, it's just literally in that same area. I did not know that. That's so awesome. I'm not sure that wasn't a parameter, but I mean, it's kind of full circle for me. No. Is it like, and you know, his family was also entrepreneurial and um, in um, different industry than technology, yeah. right? I think eyeglasses or something like that. Right. Also another Houstonian, right? Uh, he transplanted to Austin many years ago. I'm a naturalized Houstonian because okay. I've been there 40 years now, right? So I think I still have the, I do still have my first pair of cowboy boots. I think it's my first and only pair. I bought them in 1981. So we're here in Austin today, but you actually grew up in Houston. Is that right? Born and raised in Sugarland. When I was growing up, I actually wanted to be a cowboy too. Did like you the, really? Yeah. I, I was listening to like Toby Keith and Keith Urban as a five-year-old. I remember my my family had like a like a farm. I just remember the the drive was an hour and thirty minutes away. But you know, being able to to go to the farm and we didn't have any animals except for two dogs. Mm -hmm. And being greeted by two dogs as a really young kid, it was very impressionable. And I remember shoveling like cow manure to all the different plants that you know my my grandpa was was trying to do and i remember rattlesnake was trying to launch out of me he just smashed it down with the garden hoe but all that being said it's, it was like that was my like impression as an early childhood wanting to be um you know living on a farm living in a ranch riding horses and no, I'm in tech, <laughs> but well, I would say farming is actually a very entrepreneurial. It is thing to do, right? You know, I thought city folk were snobby, especially <laughs> tech people. And then also went to the University of Houston, where I studied entrepreneurship, sales, and marketing. Wow. Okay. Yeah, they didn't have entrepreneurship degrees back in my day, so I'm a little jealous about that. I had to go to the school of hard knocks for my entrepreneurship degree. Yeah. <laughs> So you graduated with an entrepreneurship degree, and then what was your first job, just out of curiosity? Well, it actually, and I was sharing this, it actually took me a while because, you know, the funny thing about, you know, being formally educated in entrepreneurship, because people ask, like, what does it mean to be formally educated in entrepreneurship? Well, the way that I like to phrase it is, like, imagine if you were thrown to the wolves, and but you had someone to cry on. So I really appreciate my professors who 
uh, same time gave us a lot of the real life applications, introduced us to like, for example, you know, Blair Guru from Mercury and a few folks from the Houston Angel Network and getting to get introduced to Houston Exponential and all the other folks. Um, and then also back then there was like Houston. Station Houston. Mm -hmm. It's oh. interesting, right? Cause you think, well, a degree in entrepreneurship, does that mean you go off and just yeah. go right into a startup? Right? Yep. Or do you go get a corporate job? And if it's a corporate job, what is it? Right? Oh, you've got an entrepreneurship degree. Oh, okay. If you're looking for jobs, especially when I was a student, if you are applying to these jobs that are specialized jobs and telling them you want to be an entrepreneur, you're good luck getting hired. Yeah. It was like, oh, so you're not going to be here that long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, oh, so yeah. that was a, a conversation. But I think overall, eventually, you know, it took me a while, but telling the folks in corporate exactly what type of specialization I wanted to to be in. And then where entrepreneurship came in is like when I got the job and started trying to figure out how can I contribute more value back to the business. And long story short, one day I created this whole pitch deck uh, in, in, at Dell when I was six months in saying like, hey, this is all the Houston startup communities. This is my relationship with them. Here's a SWOT analysis, pest analysis. This is a reason why the Dell small business team should work with the startup community, especially in Houston. And little did I know at that time, there was already a lot of MBA, you know, interns and, and professionals that were already trying to cultivate the startup program. And eventually what happened was it's one of those things where, you know, opportunity meets skill and I showed the the PowerPoint to the right person and 11 months in, they're like, hey, YJ, we love for you to help lead several initiatives. And um, ever since then, I've been with the Delphi Startups team for the past four or five years now. Well, that's an interesting point that you have. Uh, a good point to people that are working at larger corporations like Dell is that you can take those kinds of initiatives and do more than what you were asked to do and make pitches and suggestions and actually create opportunities for yourself. Yeah. Right? A lot of people just go to a job and do the job and go home. Right? Yeah. Um, but you can actually innovate even at a company like Dell. Yeah. So was that the genesis of Dell for startups then was part of your, you know, pitch deck uh, and awareness of how this might work for Dell? A little bit. I just, was very persistent and like, hey, this is something that, you know, I'm really passionate about, especially coming from the University of Houston entrepreneurship program. And this is something that I can provide value, whether or not you decide to hire me. And my manager would make fun of me sometimes to just say, it's like the first time I created this whole deck and shared it to him. And I told him like, hey, I just, I just want you to have it. I don't, I don't care about money. I don't care about getting a job. And and I'm in business development. I've been in business development for the past six years. He would make fun of me. He's like, do you still not care about money? I was like, no, I, I care a lot. But I I think at the core of it was, I was really passionate about just really how can we build communities to support each other, to support all these dreamers, the people that are decided, hey, you know what? I decided not to do corporate anymore. And I just want to work for myself. I have this mission, this dream. Yeah, we've seen that also essentially at SoftTech where we've had our Fortune 500 corporate level partners where they're often doing, you know, entrepreneurship. Yeah. They're innovating internally. You know, we get brought in to do some piece of innovation. Um, but then also we have a lot of on the opposite end, like just like yeah. you're saying, startups that are doing innovation um, that we're also helping, but being able to connect the dots between the two and inform each of like, well, this is what corporate, hey startup, this is what yeah. the corporates are looking for. Hey corporates, this is what the startups are doing right now. And maybe a source of disruption yeah. or a new market opportunities or things like that. So there is really a lot of synergy, even though you have this like barbell between yeah. like startups to Fortune 500. And then you know, there's a lot of people in corporate, they, they enjoy listening to an entrepreneur because they're able to do things without creating hundreds of PowerPoint decks and, mm -hmm. and really trying to see like, hey, if, if there's anything that we can do, it also keeps our, our mind fresh, right? Okay, this is how startups are tackling problems and, and learning how startups are necessarily like, you know, adjusting to, to how innovation is moving on almost like a daily basis at this point allows us to also rethink like, is there other business processes within our own corporation that we can help change and improve? So it's 
part of a feedback loop for Dell, right? You're getting involved in the community. Yeah. You're hearing what startups are working on. You're starting to see trends and and what 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 they're interested yeah. in, and trying to feed back into the bigger corporate yeah. mothership. The beauty of this is that when you bring startups and corporations together, you're bringing these generalists and you're bringing these specialists and you're bringing problems that both people have and they're great fit for each other. And so it just benefits both of us when we can learn that, hey, the beat of startups is that they're constantly testing things, trying things, working so cross-functionally. And the beauty of corporate is that if you want someone with 20 and 30 years of experience in engineering, you have someone there. Mm. Yeah, I think it is, like you said, different mindsets. And someone even coming from a corporate world that's now starting in the startups and say, wait a minute, I have to do a lot of that myself for one thing. I don't have a team that I can delegate to. Also, I shouldn't build it in a way that Adele would build it because you need to be very lightweight. Don't build, we say it's soft, don't build version 3.0. You don't need 3.0. And hey, guess what? Google Sheet will work just fine at this stage of your development because you're trying to get product market fit or you're trying to get proof of concept, you're trying to do MVP, you're trying to get it off the ground. But then also getting that feedback. A hundred percent. And my advice to people, the last thing that you want to do, because I'm I'm completely guilty of it, is taking your startup mindset and corporate mm-hmm. where you're not really asking like what's the proper way of doing things and, and getting in trouble in corporate and then taking your corporate mindset and your own business. And now you're over analyzing your little e-commerce board game b- business. And the problems that startups and corporations have are also completely different. Startups, the problems that they typically have is, hey, how do I scale certain processes? And then corporations, like, how do we be better at innovating? And they're completely reversed, but at a certain time, when a startup starts growing and scaling their processes, they start realizing, hey, I need more innovation to me. One of the things now that a very one, you know, has to be very conscious of, especially a lot of VCs we talk to, is like, hey, what is a technology roadmap from a cost perspective that we need to consider for our stars as they're growing, scaling their company. Because the last thing you want to do is spend $27 million on server fees, which I think that's what Netflix did for a little bit before they decided to to figure out how to get their own on-prem solutions. Mm. And that's that's really my advice for any corporate you know, professional because, and you know this, is it's the, the beauty of having, and I was sharing this with someone, the hiring practices of stars and corporates are completely different. And what we can learn from this is that startups are typically hiring generalists, corporations hiring specialists. And so for us, it's how do we leverage, you know, each stage at what there are. Over the years of being an entrepreneur, I saw there was a big gap in supporting entrepreneurs and startups, and there just wasn't really anything available. The Canon didn't exist, yep. Asian Houston didn't yep. exist, you know, all these stuff. I'm like, well, how can I actually help and help build this? And um, that's why I'm started the venture fund, why I started the venture studio, why I started the podcast, really taking a page out of the my own playbook here of, you know, how do I give back and how do I get engaged and how do I get involved? So do you mentor startups yourself? Do you get a chance yeah. to actually do that? I think my favorite startups to to mentor and really the only conversations I, I have with people is it's all about building connected communities. And one thing that I share with startups and even corporations and, and also nonprofits is how do we leverage communities in a way that allows for you to generate a positive return on investment in the first three months, knowing that community is also there as a long-term goal to build the types of people that will love your product or your service. And the reason why I share that tactically is because You see that sometimes in in not only corporations, but in startups and even nonprofits thinking, oh, community is always going to be a loss leader, right? You see a lot of social workers are going homeless because of the work that they do because they're not getting funding and they're doing it out of passion or love. But that can only take you so far until you realize, hey, I can't feed my family anymore. And one of the things I'm so passionate about this, especially in Star Wars world, is when you realize, and CB Insights did an insight on this, where they did a postmortem on 101 startups of the top 20 reasons why Star Wars fail. And five of the top 20 reasons were because a customer-related issue, not the right market side or market timing, you know, competitor product is, is being utilized. And seven of the top 20 is because of 
team related issues. My team's not focused, they're not passionate, not using your advisors. And you realize that most of the reasons are because of customer team related issues, which are all people related issues. And it's important to realize that these are also the first two questions that investors ask. It's like, how's, how big is your market size? And who's on your team? Mm -hmm. It's less about how much money you have or you know how much money you're trying to get. Or even the product tech. <laughs> or even the product tech. It's yeah. like, hey, tell me that you know your customers well and that they actually care about this. And tell me that you are the you have a team that's qualified enough to do this. And that's what investors invest in. That's what sellers invest in. And everything's all connected. And what you realize is that community is really the answer to a lot of problems that you know, not only startups, but you know, everyone in our life is having it. And so is that a particular focus for Dell for Startups or how are you trying to facilitate that community building through Dell for Startups? That's my personal mission, okay. if anything. Um, and how I do that for Dell is realizing that with, you know, how do we leverage community in a way that drives business metrics? Mm -hmm. And so with my startup partners and the partners I work with, you know, one thing that we have to do is like share that, hey, it's gonna be a little bit hard, but let's sit down and really figure out how do we drive not only Dell's business, but your community. And it's not necessarily like, oh, one, like, you know, quit, like, uh, like a zero sum game. Mm -hmm. Like, how do we like really map out this Venn diagram and figure out what are the engagements that we should be doing that benefits both parties that's in the middle. And it's a little bit harder. It requires more deliberation. It requires being honest and transparent about everyone's metrics. But if we can find it and we can make something like if we can find that middle ground, then we can make something beautiful happen. And these are all things that I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't even think about. Like, wait, I'm going to write a program. I'm going to build a piece of hardware. I'm gonna write, I've got this cool piece of software. Yeah, but you've, you've kind of skipped over the people part. There's a favorite story. I, rem uh, I remember the Airbnb founders, you know, when they were get just getting started, they're located, I think, in California. And the VCs that said, well, where's, where's your most passionate user base? You know, where do you have some traction? And they said, well, it's in New York. And uh, they're like, why are you here? Go there. You need to go there and learn more about what they're doing. And then they they actually went there. One of the things they recognized that they had very poor profiles on the Airbnb. So they're like, hey, we're going to go there and meet them, but offer to take the photos. And they were actually, the two CEOs were, were the photographers doing the first initial pictures. But they got involved in, in understanding you know, what the hosts needed and what their problems were and, and everything. But you know, it was important to be engulfed in that community and build that community. I love Airbnb because there's this phenomenal case study and how they were able to get every single or a lot of their Airbnb hosts to actually rally and lobby for them. Mm. And for them to, and, and you you probably remember this. I remember like, oh, all these Airbnb houses, like people were just making it. There's not really, it's not really a regulated market. And they were able to get all these hosts and, and create a, a community engagement plan. They actually hired people from the Obama political campaigning you know, industry to figure out how do we really leverage all these people who are so passionate about creating these, these bread and breakfasts to get them together to do rally, whether or not they can rally in person or if anything, send a letter. And it's just a beautiful case study of how to leverage community in a way that benefits everyone. It's just sad to see that some people sometimes see it as a loss leader, but I will share with them is like, how do we build community in stages? The way that you realize that startups are built in stages. As a startup, when you're pre-series to when you're revenue generating to when you're trying to grow and scale, your priorities as a CEO needs to change and adjust. And the reason why CEOs get kicked out is because the VCs realize that, hey, you as a CEO, when you're, when you're early stage, you're focused on product, do not realize that you now need to focus on scaling your revenue growth. And so if you apply the same cycle, the life cycle of a startup to community building, you'll realize that the first 50 people in your community are actually the only people who like you. Mm. And what do you? What are your priorities when you're trying to build community? Is having as many one-on-one -on -one relationships and conversations as possible. And as your community starts growing, you'll realize that it's less about you. It's now about the relationships and the value and the foundation that you're building and the relationships are being cultivated on top of this foundation. And in fact, 
your closest friends and family may actually drop from it because they realize, okay, it's, it's less about Chris, it's less about YJ, it's more about like the thing that he built. And now we can focus on how do we resolve conflicts? How do we do that? And and you realize that community, your first 50 investors, employees, and and friends are always because they like you. And you realize how important this is to be deliberative and intentional as you grow and scale to the point where, okay, now I'm at a stage where creating subgroups makes sense. And to share on top of the whole life cycle thing is like, how do we make sure that it's generating business impact? Because we can evaluate all these community health metrics, okay, engagement, uh, attendance, you know, how well is staff engaging with it? But if it's not generating business impact, as you both, you know, as we both know, then it's not gonna be sustainable. Whether you're a church, whether you are a nonprofit, you know, understanding is it if it's not financial capital, then what social capital are you generating? You know, are we generating more knowledge from it? You know, are we generating like more culture from it? Are people more happier because they're here? And how do we eventually convert it in a way that sustains the, the business model? And so my thesis and my focus is sharing through all types of communities and family members, like how do we build communities in the most sustainable way manner? so that no one's losing their life over it. Yeah, it's interesting. And so it's really a theme that's come up several times today on all of my discussions and on the on the panel that I moderated this morning is just the power of uh, and the need for founders and startups to to build their network, for example, um, get those advisors, get those make those relationships, like you said, engage with the community, give back to the community yeah. first, get involved, right? So why Jay how are you forging the future with Dell for Startups? What's next? So our program, the Dell for Startups team, we are starting to go, uh, scale it globally. And tactically, we are working with multiple community leaders all across the US. Of course, our very first partners at the Canon in Houston and really aligning with them to figure out how we can support them with all the things that we have to offer. So of course, anything from products, anything from our corporate innovation team, anything from our OEM teams that we can help manufacture a lot of equipment for them. Um, anything that, you know, especially in healthcare that needs processing or if someone needs something ruggedized. But we also have a Delta Capital team. We, and most importantly, we also have our Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network, which is a global program to support women entrepreneurs in their journeys. Mm. So your first real partner in Dell for Startups was in Houston? Yes. And I was that intentional? And it was, I think the conversation went something like, hey, YJ, we have some budget left over. You know, who should we give it to? And I said, well, I was with the Canon three quarters ago. I've been telling you to work with them. <laughs> and, you know, they're open. We could have been there because I was there when, you know, with I think Megan Berg at the time wearing a hard hat and Brow True was there. Mm -hmm. And just like, hey, we could be literally the first people. But, you know, if you want to partner with the Canons, right here. And and that was one of our very first partners. Okay. And you're looking to expand that, not just in in the US, but globally? Is that what you globally. said? Globally. So mm -hmm. right now we just started to engage with the Canadian market starting with Toronto because we have the Dell office there. Um, but really my my goal and focus is how do we understand all the different, you know, accelerators, incubators, and all the different, you know, community support organizers to figure out how we can align on the efforts that they're doing. And most importantly for me is always learning like what can I do in the most beneficial way that can help you support the rest of the city, the rest of the community leaders from an economic development perspective. And something I share with my partners, I wanna know that I can provide you value other than just sponsoring the things that you're doing. So what are the, what are the things that are you offering for startups? If I'm a startup, do I approach Dell for startups for something? Yeah. Or um, do I apply somewhere? What, what, what might I get from that program? Yeah. They can reach out to me or my team. And, and really for us is we just want to be there as a support. And I think to the core of how he, you know, the spirit of, of how he started a company, it was really us emphasizing that we really want to create custom solutions through advice. Mm. And that's really our biggest value prop is that, hey, we have a, we have a team of 20, 30, 40, 50 people who have industry experience, have tech experience, and especially as startups are, are growing their journeys. Okay, so it's both like how, maybe configuring custom PCs yeah. for a startup, startup's needs or other custom hardware, 
Um, is it cloud services and things like that, or what? It's a mix. I think mm -hmm. for us, the biggest thing is just making sure that they have the right advice, mm -hmm. they have the right knowledge, and people knowing that there's people willing to help them out. And then beyond that, we have a phenomenal corporate innovation team. Mm -hmm. We have you know the manufacturing team that can have actually help build certain things, especially if they need uh, custom you know operating systems on on boxes. And then in addition, you know, we have a phenomenal, you know, capital team. And then of course, for any female founders uh, or allies joining our Dell Women's Entrepreneur Network platform. But all that being said, you know, one of the biggest things as you're familiar with corporate is really how do we align on all these different corporate efforts? And then when we go to our partners sharing with them like, hey, it would be really helpful if all of you as a community leader are also aligned and working together to support the city. Hmm. Okay. Are those like mentors that have like signed up to say, hey, I'd, I'd love to help mentor a startup and my job is UI or project management or whatever at Dell, but I'm happy to give some of my time advising a startup? Yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. okay. Lots of mentors, a lot of architects, a lot of, you know, tech advisors that, that can support them. And it's realizing the certain mentalities at the different stages that you are at by realizing that a lot of problems that you have at a certain stage, the person on the other side of the spectrum can support you. If you're looking to scale and be a business and you're looking to see whether this is something that um, companies will use, and especially if you're B, you know, B2B, it's important to get that feedback from the larger companies of like, hey, what would work for them? Yeah. And at what level would the product need to be in order for that company to start using it? Um, and that's really where the, the advisors and the mentor, but if you're a startup and your first hires are like specialized. Like you don't hire a back-end developer, you hire a full stack developer mm -hmm. when you first start off. And then if you do need specialized, you find an agency, mm -hmm. you find a accelerator program who can provide that specialized knowledge. And then as a as in a corporate entity, your first hires are, hey, I just need someone who can focus on sales. Well, I mean, that's definitely, a, sounds like a good fit for you yeah. to be at Dell and be in tech. And then kudos for also forming your own road toward Hey, an entrepreneurial degree, heading up a program like Dell for startups, sounds like Nirvana to me. Uh. Everything eventually played out, even though I didn't see it at that time. Mm -hmm. And I think the the beautiful thing is just, you know, how the universe works to to connect all the dots together mm -hmm. at the end of the day. And mm -hmm. so I do feel very blessed to to be where I am and to be able to reflect back to all the trials and hardships and realize like, oh, everything happened for a reason. I'm excited for Houston and what I'm seeing there as far as, you know, growing startups yeah. and becoming what we're the third largest city now yeah. in the United States and the diversity of Houston and both from, you know, the scalability that Houston offers. And, um, you know, I, you know, Houston is a very, and, and Texas in general, very collaborative, very friendly city. I think most people are surprised when they come to Houston and they see that because they all have a mental image of what Texas is like and it's nowhere near what it actually is, right? But thanks for being on the show today and uh, it's going to be great to watch you uh, help Dell for Startups grow and the impact that you're going to have on those communities that you're talking about. Thanks for having me, Chris. Right, thank it's you. my pleasure.